What if we were told about farming, agriculture, and the health of the soil wasn't 100% true? Well, stay tuned to today's episode to find out more. Welcome back to the Sarah Kleiner Wellness YouTube channel. Today, I have Matt from Cultivate Elevate on the show to talk about electroculture, as well as just dispelling a lot of myths that we have around light, around plants, around food, nutrition, and so much more. It's a very, very interesting conversation, and I hope we don't lose too many people, but I think a lot of this information needs to be talked about and shared. It's very, very fascinating information. So make sure to follow Matt and Cultivate Elevate. I will put all of his links and his website down in the show notes so that you can check him out and follow his work. It is very interesting over on Instagram and he has a Telegram channel as well with 45,000 subscribers where they share really, really interesting information and photos about these techniques he's talking about with electroculture. So make sure to check that out. And I want to thank the sponsors of today's episode. Viva Rays is the first one. You can use my code YOGI to save 15% on their circadian glasses, low EMF headphones, earplugs, and eye masks. So check them out linked in the show notes. The second sponsor of today's episode is going to be Upgraded Formulas. You can use my code YOGI12 or YOGI if you've already used that one before to save on their hair tissue mineral analysis with a consultation or on any of their minerals in general. So all of that will be linked down in the show notes for you to check out. And thank you so much for watching today's episode. Give us a like, leave us a comment, especially if you find this information interesting. And I will talk with you again very soon. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. I have a guest here by popular demand, Matt from Cultivate Elevate. And we're just going to talk about all the things. Thank you so much, Matt, for being here today. Happy to be here and happy to talk. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your main mission um, with electroculture, with the plants. Let's let's talk about that. And then maybe we can dive into some topics like we'll just kind of see where the conversation goes. Of course. So the main mission with Cultivate Elevate is to provide solutions and not fear. And so I've been very big about providing different types of solutions, whether it's your health, whether it's your terrain, whether it's your garden, you know, all these things, because I realize that we can all have abundance and abundance exists all around everywhere all around us. And we have to just tap into that instead of being into the fear, the fear state, because the fear state controls us. But as I got into this topic of electroculture, it's basically using the ether to increase your yields. You're basically taking copper and making an antenna, placing it into the soil, and you're going to start to harness all the beautiful energy that's all around us. What I noticed was, was this goes back all the way to 1835 with the Royal Agriculture Society when they were studying electroculture and writing essays about electroculture mm -hmm. and how they were increasing their yields and having tremendous results. So people were growing two to three times the size of tomatoes, potatoes, you know, watermelon, squash, cucumber, all these things. They had so much food, they didn't know what to do with it. And it was just remarkable. And what was interesting is as I got into this topic, I also started to notice as I started to practice electroculture and get into it, that I had more bees, more pollinators, more birds, you know, all these beautiful animals and insects that are all around us, they're attracted to that beautiful energy. Mm -hmm. You start getting into electroculture and you start tapping into Mother Earth's energy. You start to notice that, like I said, you'll have all these beautiful animals and insects start coming around because you're, you're complementing your home and your terrain and your garden. And that's what kind of dabbled me into it when I did an Akashic reading back in 2020. A lady told me to look into crop circles. And when we did the Akashic reading, she goes, you'll look into crop circles and you'll kind of figure it out. And as I started getting into it, I started getting into crop circles, pyramid energy. I started getting into all these different people's work of what they were understanding about the ether and this energy that's all around us. And it's all free. You know, we just aren't taught about it because yeah. you can't put a meter on it. So, you know, it, when I got into this topic, it was absolutely beautiful, but it's a remarkable way to help elevate your terrain. I love that. And and I think like what we were talking about before I even turned the camera on, there's a lot of fear going around and I love the history. You know, I feel like there's a lot of history. Like I just did a really wonderful episode on homeopathy and I've been trying to talk about some of these ancient, uh, or not even really ancient, but things that have been forgotten and that have been 
slapped a label on as uh, woo woo or witchcraft or, you know, uh, quackery is the big one. And a lot of these things like, like what you're talking about have been forgotten and tossed to the side and, and why that is and, and kind of how did we get away from this? If it was working so well, like you said, back in the 1800s, how did we forget about it? How did we get away from it? And why, why are we not doing it now? So this is a combination. You have the Rockefellers and the Carnegies who took over the educational system. You know, that was a big thing about, about the 1900s. They started getting rid of a lot of things related to this. Anything that was teaching critical thinking was also removed. And then, you know, anything of the terms of woo-woo, quackery, or any of those terms, those are all terms that were put in place with the educational system or the medical system to basically, you know, kind of go against what people were talking about with the truth. I mean, that's where the whole thing with the quack came from. Anybody who yep. was doing natural medicine was known as quack. Quack, yeah. So, yeah, so when you get into this, and it's like natural is the ultimate way because there's no side effects. No one's being harmed from just going out into nature and collecting some basil. You know, they're just right. being healed. And so, you know, as we got into this, we saw all this suppression. We saw a lot of books getting removed. We've seen so many things through the past. And it's interesting because there's been so many resets. If you look at all the world fairs, if you look at all the world wars and all of the wars that occurred, each one acted as a reset to get rid of certain information. As that information was lost, then people would then have to basically learn again. And sometimes chemical farming, like Monsanto and DDT and all that stuff, took its place because now the new people are like, oh, we need chemicals. We can use that. But they lost the ability to tap into the ether. And the biggest one that I've ever learned was that ether was before Einstein. You know, Einstein was actually trying to debunk ether and all of this energy. And so they started moving with Einstein forward to get rid of ether and remove that terminology from our educational system. And then people were like, nah, ether's woo-woo. We shouldn't yeah. have those things. But in reality, you know, it's been around since before the educational system was changed. Yeah. And, you know, the, like I said, there's a lot of fear around these topics because, yeah, when, whenever I hear the word quack, I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> Somebody, somebody's somebody been uh, dabbling in uh, in Rockefeller medicine. Someone, someone's dabbling in fear, essentially, because and they've got a closed mind. And, um, you know, I think that that's one thing that I want people to get out of this episode is just to have an open mind and to to be willing to look at things a little bit differently. I'm always trying to kind of push that a little bit gently with my people. Sometimes we go over a little bit over the edge, but um, what would you say is the biggest benefit that people see besides, I love this abundance and growth. Um, what are some of the other benefits that people can have by implementing some of these techniques? So with implementing these techniques, I mean, people will have more food, you know, they'll yield more, they'll have more beautiful pollinators. A lot of people are having trouble with bees, you know, yes. that they don't have enough bees and the bees are being impacted by our cell phone towers and all these things. So, you know, they'll have a lot more bees and a lot more beautiful pollinators. I mean, I've seen almost everything on my balcony in Scottsdale, you know, on the third floor, I've seen, you know, hummingbirds, I've seen giant mm -hmm. grasshoppers, I've seen bats. I've never wow. even seen bats before in Scottsdale ever. They started coming around. I used to have them on, on the door, you know, on the outside of the door and things wow. like that. All these beautiful animals and things start coming around because they can pick up on that energy. Mm -hmm. So if every person was doing this, think of the impact we would have on the earth. You know, and this takes us back into the lightning rods and the weather vanes, which used to be all over the tops of the buildings. You see all these old cathedrals, mm -hmm. tons of lightning rods and weather vanes. Those are balancing out the atmosphere and balancing out the energy. That's why when you walk into a cathedral, you begin to heal because of the materials that are there and the atmospheric antennas. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is we're tapping into that and then we're elevating our terrain so that it's a healthier place. Because that's the other thing. When you do a lot of yeah. grounding and you do a lot of barefoot grounding, you know, you're really connecting into the earth. If you have these antennas placed in that area, now you're amplifying that area and it causes you to heal faster. Mm -hmm. They've even shown with animals that their fur would grow quicker. So like if a sheep was around these antennas, their fur would grow faster. Or if mm. people had, for example, chickens, they would lay two to three times the eggs. You know, so it works on so many different ways. And it goes back into the work of George Lakofsky and the multi-wave oscillator where he was healing people with frequencies. So that's what we're doing. We're tapping into all of that to start to heal us on the same frequency of the Mother Earth or 7.83 hertz. Mm. 
Yeah. And so there's a biogeometry thread kind of in here as well, then would you say? There's definitely, I mean, everything, biogeometry, sacred, sacred geometry, everything's connected. You know, we just aren't taught about these things right? because it, it, it gets into, like you said, the woo woo, the quackery and all the other things, because it's the, even where the pseudoscience came from. Yes. Know? So and that's the other one. Yes. And saying that term, you know, everything pseudoscience is like, what are, you, what are you talking about? You're just making up terms to try to debunk what's the truth. Right. Absolutely. Dismiss. Yeah. And dismiss it and then say it's, you know, false and misleading information, which is just, you know, all these terms that have been used to really it's to, it's to go against our natural gut instinct. That's mm -hmm. what it is, because our natural gut instinct is something is off. Something is wrong. You know, our food is not the same. Our air is not the same. Our water you know, and naturally we're having these instincts, but they're using these terms to make us think that our instinct is incorrect. And then they label it with some silly term. Exactly. Yeah. How do you feel about um, EMFs with grounding? I just had Dr. Conover on a few episodes ago and we talked about grounding and non-native EMF. And do you think that some of these methods with the copper wire can actually help because you mentioned you're in the middle of Scottsdale. So that could that help mitigate some of this issues that we have with non-native EMF? So definitely. You know, I mean, the thing is, is, you know, we have man-made frequencies. That's mm -hmm. what the cell phone towers are. They're all man-made. Mm -hmm. And this is helping to resonate the Earth's frequency, which is primary. You know, so we have the man-made, which are secondary. And then we have the Earth, which is primary. And what happens is, is it starts to help it heal the plants and help to move the sap. You know, a lot of these frequencies, which are pulsating all the time, are impacting the plants. That's why you'll see like a bush and the one side of the bush is all kind of, it looks like it's not doing well. And then you mm -hmm. see the other side of the bush and it's doing really well. Usually the side that's not doing too well is facing towards a tower. It's actually absorbing those frequencies. So when we're placing these antennas and putting these into the soil, what we're going to do is we're going to help elevate the electricity or the flow of energy through the entire plant because that one side is suffering. So it can actually work really well for combating or reflecting or countering a lot of the nonsense we face. Interesting. Yeah, I think there's, again, a lot of fear around non-AVMF, and I'm, I'm not saying anyone should go bathe in it or live, purposely live near a tower, but um, I don't think that we can escape it necessarily. I think that you can move somewhere and you can't control if they're going to build a tower. You can't control if there are going to be satellites. And so what I'm really interested in, you know, kind of explaining to my community is how we can um, still thrive within these frequencies, how we can still offset those um, and be healthy. And there are some people, you know, say that we can't do that and we're we're doomed, but I just don't. I don't like to have that sort of, um, you know, idea of life. And I don't like to have that sort of mindset with life that I'm powerless and there's nothing I can do. Um, so what, what are your thoughts on, on the no escaping and <laughs> how do you feel about that? So it is challenging. Cause yes, like you said, I mean, even in Scottsdale, I mean, they keep putting them up. I feel like mm -hmm. they love cell phone towers and red light cameras. That's pretty much what they oh, seem yeah. to like a lot, you know, and whatever. But, you know, so it is challenging, but going out into nature is very important, connecting, barefoot grounding. You can even lay your whole body on the ground like a starfish, mm -hmm. you know, so that every every part of your body is touching the earth. It's very important. You know, and there are things people can do in their house because, you know, even though things do travel through the walls, you can mitigate what's in your home. You know, and a simple solution is just hardwiring your Internet, you know, getting rid of the Wi-Fi setting that's on your router and hardwiring with an ethernet cord and a USB adapter anytime you need the internet. So like right now, as we do this podcast, my cord is connected in and I have the internet and it's faster than Much everything faster. that you try to sell us. And it's safer because mm -hmm. nobody can hack into it and get all your information and connect into your light bulbs and your stoves and all kinds of weird things that they're trying to push. You know, so with that, you know, just, just hardwiring is huge. You know, the other option that people can do, too, as well, is, is paying attention to what type of clothes they're wearing. Mm. Linen cannot gather static. It's one of the most beautiful frequencies or beautiful um, materials that we can wear. And if a person's having, for example, restless leg syndrome and can't sleep that much because of too much static buildup, they can try linen sheets. Sleeping in linen sheets can be very healing. All that light frequency that's coming off the sheets actually starts the body to heal. And they used to use those in hospitals to make people heal faster back in the day, but they kind of changed those out, you know, so they could make money. 
But that's a that's another great solution. And then just also obviously being aware of your lights, you know, making sure that you have incandescence or halogens in the house, very important, so that they're not pinging these frequencies. But there's things that people can do in their home that are just simple. And if every person worked on healing their home and saying, yeah, we're all going to hardwire our internet, we're not going to use the Wi-Fi, you know, I'm not going to use this, and I'm going to use airplane mode more often, and I'm going to do these things, all of a sudden, the whole the whole infrastructure is not needed anymore. But if people are more reliant and they're bringing out these, um, you know, smart devices and all these things which sync up to the internet, then they get in more demand. But people can vote with their money to basically say, we don't want to support this. Mm -hmm. And we see this all the time. Boycotts happen all the time and they do work. So, you know, it's important to be aware of that. Absolutely. Yeah, I feel like that's uh, a big topic with people of like, how can I, you know, what can I do? The light bulbs have been a big thing. And I saw that kind of go viral on your uh, your Instagram. And I think a lot of people actually sent me the reel that you did on the light bulbs. And that's, so let's maybe talk about that a little bit because there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of fear since we have, I guess, incandescents are not really readily available anymore. So maybe we can talk about that whole thing and then what you recommend for people. So the first option is knowing about the Centennial light bulb which is the oldest, longest lasting lit light bulb on the planet. It's been lasting over 110 years and it's an incandescent that uses four watts and it's in California. So when they try to tell us that we need LEDs and LEDs are gonna save the planet, we already had bulbs that were already saving the planet and lasted 120 years. So we wouldn't have to replace anything. But a lot of over time with the, you know, the changes that occurred, the light bulb com companies got together and they reduced the duration of light bulbs so that they didn't last as long to kind of push us into the whole led thing and this is a fun one for people to go look into mm -hmm. but as for the videos i did a video on showing the difference between an incandescent bulb and an led bulb the led bulb emits a blue light spectrum which can impact the eyes and it also emits radio frequencies similar to a cell phone so the issue with the leds is that they'll impact the eyes because of the wavelengths and then also these frequencies that are pulsed so when it comes to if we're trying to save things, it doesn't make any sense, make a lot of sense if it's going to impact our health. So the best option would be incandescents or halogens. Now, you can still find them online and you can still find them on eBay and all these different sites and things like that. They said they were going to get rid of them. But what they did was they got rid of a certain wattage. So it was mm -hmm. about 25 to 40 watts. There's still 60 watts and up and a whole bunch of the ones. So they got rid of the low wattage ones, which is interesting. So they're trying to only keep the high wattage, which is using more energy. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't make a lot of sense for saving energy and whatever. Mm -hmm. else. So with that, you can still get those, and those are a very safe option. The difference with the incandescent is that they're not flickering. A lot of people who have seizures get impacted by LEDs because the flicker rate, it's very, very fast. Yeah. And, you know, that, that pulsing. And then also, too, the color spectrum. The, infrar the infrared and the UV are closer on the incandescent bulb, which is actually very beneficial. And this was shown by Dr. John I uh, or Dr. Mm -hmm. John Odd with uh, Health and yeah. Life. Yeah, mm -hmm. where he showed about how light bulbs, the best option is incandescent. You know, and all the other ones are kind of very strange. So when we get into this one, we want to stick to something natural. The other option is, let's say somebody can't find, you know, uh, incandescents or halogens. You can do things with candles. You know, you can do different, all different types of things with candles. You can even get a cone so that it can amplify that light. You know, you can use the windows as well, you know, use as much, get as much sunlight as you can go out into nature, you know, use, if you have to use these lights, because that's all you have for some reason, then you can use them sparingly. You know, there's, there's a lot of things or put it in another room. So at least it's not lighting up the room that you're in, you know, but there's a lot of things that people can do. And it's just little things because once you have, for example, the, the old school bulbs, the incandescents, they last a really long time. Mm -hmm. And I did a video showing how the, uh, the amount of money that you'll pay on an LED and an incandescent is the exact same. And they showed it right on the box. It says how much you'll save and it's right on the box. So it's like they're showing us all this stuff about how this is going to do this, but then they're not talking about, you know, X, Y, Z. And the weird thing, you know, just so people are aware with LED lights, is the street lights that are on the street are mm -hmm. the same lights that they want you to bring into your home. So if you don't like the street lights, that's the same emitting weird, you know, pulsation that's coming into your home. 
So if you can think about that, you know, if they already bother you while you drive, it doesn't make a lot of sense to bring them into your home. So mm -hmm. there are different things, but it's just, it's crazy when you get into light spectrum because light spectrum plays such a role on our health, you know, and yeah. Dr. John Ott showed any ailment could be fixed with just sunshine. So if we're exposed to these artificial or digital lights, they can actually mess with our health. I agree a hundred percent. Yeah. That's, and that's a tough sell for people because yeah. And that's what I talk about quite a bit. We are so attached to our devices, um, attached to Netflix and chill attached to, uh, just, you know, being on the computer, like right now though, I mean, there's things you can do. Like I've got the window open. I don't have any lights on. I've got hardwired computer. I've got Iris software on my computer. So there's, there's a lot of things that you can do. Um, but getting people to kind of step away from that mindset of being so attached to their technology, I think can be a really hard push for some people, would you say? I would say so. And the other thing somebody can do is they can turn on the black and white setting on their phone or computer. So right now, as we do this podcast, everything's in black and white. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because when you turn on the black and white setting, things get really boring. Your Very technology boring. is not fun anymore because we've gotten rid of the artificial flavors from our diet but now we have artificial colors and those artificial colors are just drawing us in like a casino. You know, you got all these colors popping and it gets you a, the dopamine going. So it's important to be aware if you start using black and white settings, even if you just try it, you know, once or twice a week, see how you feel. I guarantee your phones, you can't even shop, you know, you can't even buy anything because you can't see what it looks like, you know, right. it's all black and white. So it changes everything. So, you know, there are things to do, but like you just said, we have to also disconnect and get out into nature. Mm -hmm. Because nature just, I mean, right now, as I see these beautiful, you know, pink flowers in front of me, there's so much beauty and color to the natural colors that we see rather than the artificial. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I keep my phone uh, red all the time because it's the same thing. And I have a lot of my clients do the same. Oh, I do have all my clients do the same thing. Like as a basic thing is turn your phone screen red. You can go on YouTube and Google whatever phone you have and then turn phone screen red. There's always videos out there that can show you how to do that. But that's one of the first things that people tell me is that, oh gosh, I really just became uninterested in my phone. I didn't feel like scrolling and looking at these stupid videos. Like all of a sudden it just became uninteresting to me. I'm like, yeah, that's good because you don't have that big hit of blue light of unfiltered blue light. That's not balanced out by the other colors to offset it. And yeah, it just becomes a lot less interesting. Well, and if you look at the apps, they pick certain colors, they pick mm -hmm. red, they pick black, they pick yellow, you know, they pick certain types of vibe. There's certain certain color spectrums that they pick, like even YouTube. Mm -hmm. Everything is very vivid and like really to get your eyes open, you know. So you you really look at that and go, yeah, if you don't have that anymore, then it's not the same. Right. And then as that, you know, kind of gets disconnected, you'll want to do other things. And I do a lot of reading. I collect a lot of books and do a lot of reading. And, you know, that's something that's you just the, reading from a book is just totally different. Oh, because people can't do it anymore. They want the Kindle say, still. Because the material, too, of the book, you know, some mm -hmm. of the older books were made out of linen and cotton and all these beautiful materials. So you would feel that material while you're reading. Mm -hmm. When we're scrolling and going through these things, like you said, sometimes we're not even there's no material. There's no there's no sense being used. Just obviously we're listening or watching. But, you know, just sitting there reading a book can be very helpful, too. And if you have the wrong light bulbs like we were talking about in the house, it's very hard for you to read. It's very mm -hmm. hard to focus and pay attention, you know, mm -hmm. so all these things go hand in hand. But yes, it's it's a miraculous thing when you go black and white mode or the red mode or anything else instead of the traditional colors you see. Absolutely. Well, I was listening to you talk on another podcast a little bit more about the electroculture stuff that you do and different phases of the moon and how that kind of plays into everything that you do. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So the moon cycles are very interesting. So we have a 28 day moon cycle. There's 13 every year and we have a 12 month calendar, which is funny, but we have, so we have the 13 moons. And so there's a 28 day cycle. You have basically the beginning, which is the new moon. And you have 14 days going up to the full moon. You have very high energy. That's usually when all the craziness occurs. And then you have the full moon, which is the peak. And then you have 14 days going down, which is the calming time, which is right now, actually. It's just very calm, very quiet, very peaceful. And this cycle repeats every 28 days. Mm -hmm. Go through this as, as humans, as animals, as everything, but also plants, too. The sap of the plant actually starts moving at the beginning of the new moon and goes up at the full moon at the peak. 
And once it hits the full moon, that's when you're supposed to harvest your food because the sap is at the perfect ratio for the perfect taste. So if you want to make a, the best meal you know, of, of your, your month, you do it at the full moon because the sap is at the perfect ratio. And then so that flavor profile is, is perfect. And then as the, the full moon goes away and it starts to disappear, then the sap starts to travel back down. So all of these moon cycles really play a role on our energy, on our mind. You know, the most babies are born on a full moon. My you son know. was born on a full moon and conceived on a full moon. <laughs> yeah. So like all yeah. these things, you know, there's all this energy. There's the, the moon is constantly pulling. You know, that's what creates the large waves. That's what creates people to kind of sometimes go a little crazy because mm -hmm. polarity, there's a polarity flip on their in their body. So then they can kind of start maybe hearing things or seeing things. You know, there's some the spooky things that people talk about as well, too. And then also, too, the pulling of the toxins on the body. You know, when you get into all the things about everybody's doing cleanses during the mm -hmm. full moon, it's because there's toxic buildup in the body and the moon is pulling on those toxins, mm -hmm. depending on the location in which they are in the body. And they could be then impacting somebody. So someone could say, oh, I got a severe headache. The moon's pulling on your head and all the all the water in your head. But when it comes to plants, you know, planting around the full moon is very beneficial, too, because you, since you have the largest pull going on, that seed can then sprout at almost 100 percent because it's being pulled on by that moon. But the moon cycles are very fascinating because if you look at all the events we've ever faced, they're always around the time of which a full moon occurs. And then large storms and weather events and all these things. Same exact thing, you know, so we, we really have to pay attention to the moon more often. And I've been doing I actually just posted the other day on Telegram. We were talking about how the moon's been doing a lot of really weird stuff all across the world right now, hmm. where, for example, the last couple of days, it's supposed to be like 60 to 70 percent visible. And it's just not been showing up. And like here in Arizona, the moon has not shown up till almost midnight, which is very rare because it usually shows up at about six or seven. And I put up a post and multiple people across the world were also saying, like in Florida, there's just no moon. So weird things that are occurring, but we need to pay attention because, you know, when we look at the sky, it's it's a calendar. That's kind of what mm -hmm. it is, a calendar of all these things happening. And we should just be paying attention. And it's just a very interesting thing when you get into all the stuff that happens during the full moon and the new moon as well. Interesting. Let's talk about the new moon a little bit, because I'm interested to hear about that. So with the new moon, you have the peak of the energy, and they say that's when the sun is closest to the moon. That's so The full moon is when it's the farthest away. The new moon is when it's the closest. So that's another time of high energy. That's another time in which, like you were saying, the babies are born or, you know, the people kind of can maybe a little lose it or whatever it may be. But it's another time in which is high energy as well. But these cycles are just very interesting because they, they we go through it every single month. Mm -hmm. And you start paying attention to this. You just start paying attention to the moon cycles and you'll start to see it just works like a perfect calendar. And even your friends and family, if your friends and family get a little, you know, a little much around that time, you'll always see that at the new moon and the full moon, that's when all the craziness kind of occurs. So it's it's just interesting because everything is amplified. And mm -hmm. I've started to think of the moon as something that's amplifying the sound on the planet. There's a sound frequency. If you think of right now as the sound of the moon is going away, it's kind of getting really low and really quiet. Then as the moon comes out and it starts to get larger, it starts to get very loud. Everything around you, people start driving more, they start going places, they start going on trips and things like that. Um, you know, all of those things are happening because the sound frequency. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it as a, as a point of irritability, a sound frequency that's very high pitched or a louder sound could make you very irritable. So it's just my theory on that. But I just think that the moon plays a very large role in that. And there's sound vibrations that are constantly happening. And around the new moon to the full moon, that sound is the highest. What are your thoughts on uh, parasites and the new moon and the full moon? There's a lot of talk lately about detoxing and cleansing and parasites. And I'm just curious to, to hear where you think all that kind of comes in or if it doesn't. So with the parasite situation, I mean, I, I think personally, I think the moon is playing a big role on this whole situation. And I think of more of the parasites as toxins and toxic buildup in the body. And the moon is then pulling on those toxins. So that's why people start to experience all these issues when the when the new moon or the full moon is coming. And they do a lot of cleansing during that mm -hmm. time. Because if you think about it, if you had, a let's say, just a, a, a pound of toxins built up into your gut lining, and then this moon comes around and starts pulling on it. 
you're going to start to go, you're going to be in pain and agony and all these things and maybe experience some, you know, emotional things as well too. And I think that has a lot more to do with the moon rather than the parasites themselves. Because a lot of the things, when you look at these parasite cleanses, a lot of it is just to clean out the gut lining. Mm -hmm. That's not what you're doing. You're cleaning, you're, you're almost doing an enema. That's the best way to describe it. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So you're just cleaning out the gut lining. So, and we all need to clean out our gut lining because it's Mm -hmm. important because Mm -hmm. You don't know how long things have been sitting inside of you of some food that you ate or or something that you drank. And I think of it more as toxins rather than parasites, because if we get into, you know, parasites, it's you get into worms and all types of things. And I think things are meant to be in the body to agree. You don't know how much is supposed to be there and, you know, exist there. And maybe just maybe if a person does have, I don't know, let's say worms or whatever, maybe those worms are trying to clean up the body. You right. Know? That's what I was going to say. They're there for a purpose. Like, yes. do we need yes. to be killing everything? Because there's probably a reason why they're there, right? Yes. And that's that's kind of how I see things. I, I look at everything should be in balance. And I shouldn't be just trying to destroy my guts, you know, and my lining and things like that and whatever else. And a lot of those herbs and those things are, like I said, they're just, they're just to help clean the digestion mm-hmm. and kind of get things flowing. And if things yeah. aren't flowing, then, you know, the body doesn't work. So yeah. Yeah, when it comes to it, I, I think that it, it gets too much. And I think also to the other part of the, you know, the parasite situation that people might not be paying attention to is the frequencies. Radio I was going to ask about that. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Because those, you know, amplify the impact on the blood brain barrier or the intestinal line. So if a toxin gets in near that toxin will get in quicker because of that. So, you know, we're looking at like I said, we always look here as, as something over here, but we're not looking at the other side, which can be, like I said, the radio frequencies or the moon. You know, if, mm-hmm. if everything is water, your whole body is structured yeah. water and you have this big you know, thing that's floating in the air and it's pulling on your water, it's going to pull on every cell or everything in your body. And we, we really should start paying attention to that because then we can start to look at, you know, I'm going to do this during this time and see how I feel and then just kind of go from there. And it's also good when it comes to like the fasting and cleansing to give your time or give your body time to regenerate and heal. That's what we don't do enough of. We're always mm-hmm. go, 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 but we need time to regenerate and heal. So if you think about it, it would almost make sense to kind of do your cleansing when the, when the full moon is over and these 14 days are resting and repairing. Mm-hmm. So now you're moving in that same cycle as the rest and repair. Versus if you're trying to cleanse when everything's high energy, you're going to be getting all messed up because, you know, everybody's having high energy and things like that. And then it's also harder for your gut lining to work when everything's high energy. Exactly. I hope you're enjoying today's episode with Matt from Cultivate Elevate. All of his information will be in the show notes, so make sure to check that out. I just wanted to thank you for listening to today's episode and remind you that you can always get my free resources at my website, sarahkleinerwellness.com, and look at the free resources if you're looking to dive into some of this alternative way of looking at your health from a different point of view. That is always on my website, always available. And if you're looking to dive deeper into this information with a course, you can use the code podcast to save 10% off of the courses. And that also will be linked in the show notes for you, or you can just go to my website, sarahkleinerwellness.com. If you are enjoying the episode, make sure to leave us a like or a comment and let's go ahead and jump back into it. Yeah, that's that's the thing. I mean, I think people don't pay attention to that infradian rhythm. They just kind of are like, I'm just going to fast when I'm going to fast. I'm going to, or I'm going to just eat all the time. Like there's a rhythm, there's a circadian rhythm and there's a secanual rhythm. Like I think we should eat differently in the summer than we should in the winter. We should fast differently. We should fast more, I think, in the winter than we should in the summer. That's just my opinion because there's more, there's less abundance in the winter time. But we have been become so disconnected from these rhythms of the moon, of the sun, that people just, you know, they go eat the fast food or even just they stay on the same diet 365 days a year and they don't really respect these natural rhythms that exist. Well, I like how you said that because the food is always there. Mm -hmm. It's never truly a food shortage. You know, there'd be a revolution. But, you know, with that, you know, we we really look at it and go, yes, it's you're if you're eating the same things all year, it doesn't make any sense Mm -hmm. because the body doesn't work that way and seasons don't work that way. 
And like you said, yes, it could make more sense to be fasting in the wintertime too, to give your body a, a break, you know, and, and there's not as much food, you know? So it's, like you said, we became very disconnected and that's been the programming over time, you know, mm-hmm. telling you that you need like a low fat diet and a low sugar diet. And then, then they, next week they make up a new diet and all these different things. And people are losing their natural instinct, you know, and that's why I always say connecting to nature is so important because it brings back your natural instinct and you see through all the nonsense, you know, it pretty mm-hmm. much just cleans the blinders and you're just like, nah, I don't think that feels right. You know, it yeah. doesn't resonate the same. And I think it's just important to go back to, like you said, that resonance and pay attention, you know, not just do things because we're doing them or they're available. And like right. with the food always being there, you know, you can, you don't have to eat it. You can turn right. it down. You know, they're, right. they're the option too. Yeah. I think that's, I did a post on Instagram a couple of weeks ago about the worst foods to eat during the winter. <laughs> and I can't tell you how many people got so mad. And I had someone say, there's no, um, scientific basis for this. You're just making things up. And I'm like, really? Because what did that, what did we do before transportation? What did we do before grocery stores? What, what the heck do you think we did? You think we were able to just eat pineapples and bananas like in the middle of January? No. <laughs> it's, like yeah. It's, it's hard for people to wrap their heads around it. Cause we're just like, just go to the grocery store and get whatever you want at any time of the year. Well, and that's the thing too, is that's, that doesn't, that's not how your body's supposed to function. Right. You know, like you said, it, it, and the thing is, is when, when we ask what's the science, mm-hmm. well, a lot of the science has never been shown to be true in the first place. Right. You know, if we get, I, we can get into a lot of topics on that one, but a lot of the stuff that we were told one thing ended up being the opposite. So, you know, that's kind of what I always kind of go, I kind of go with whatever I'm being told. That's probably the opposite. And even with what we're eating or what we're doing is probably the opposite as well, because, you know, there was a I think there was a great study where uh, I think it was I forget what it was in a book I was reading, but they were talking about how like they had a mouse and they basically had two different or they had two two different uh, mice. And the one mouse was like fed, ex, you know, just tons of food. And the other the other one was fasting. And that other mouse that was fasting lived an additional 20 years compared to the one that was eating all the time. Wow. Crazy like that. And it was just such a remarkable difference. Then they started doing it with fish. They did it with like turtles. They did it with all these different animals. And they noticed that all of the animals who were doing the fasting, they look better. They were healthier. Their hair was better. They all all these beautiful things. But the ones who were constantly consuming were just falling apart. Mm-hmm. And we have to think of the energy principle of how much time it takes to digest food. Because when you're digesting, your brain's not working. That's why a lot of people eat at, you know, five o'clock and they're like, I can't think. Because now your energy is all going to break, do- break down that food. So like you were saying is if we're in this constant eating cycle, that's 365 days. When does the, t- the body have time to heal and regenerate and repair? Because a lot of the fasting cycle is when re- regeneration occurs, new cells are being created. Right. But if the body is using that energy, then it can't happen. Exactly. I mean, that's what I, I talk about all day long is like everyone is obsessed with, you know, eating X amount of times a day or like different diets. And I'm like, just kind of throw that all out and just think about what makes sense. Think about your body in the winter time, we make more melatonin because there's more darkness, there's more scarcity. And so when you make more melatonin, then there's more autophagy and apoptosis and those cells can actually die or repair if they need to be repaired. But if you're constantly in this artificial eternal summer with the lights on and eating whatever fruits that you want to eat in the middle of the winter, your body never has this chance to actually heal. And I think you know, everyone blames like, oh, processed foods. And yeah, I think processed foods are crap and we should eat uh, locally and seasonally. Absolutely. But you can eat, um, you know, tons of fruit and inappropriate vegetables in the winter time. And I think that that can create as much of a circadian mismatch and inflammation, um, maybe not as much as processed foods, but that's similar. You know, I think you can still not give your body that chance to actually rest, restore and repair if you're constantly just in that fed state, you know? 
Well, I, I like that you said that because if you think about certain fruits, they only grow at certain times. With the UV index at a specific yeah. place. And the so UV like index a, doesn't go that high in the winter. Yeah. So like, you know, like a pear can only grow at a certain time and apricot right. can only grow at a certain time. So it doesn't make any sense that the apricot's there all year because right. it wouldn't be growing all the time. So we do have these natural cycles and we should follow them more often and pay attention, you know, and as as people eat with the season, certain things are easier to digest probably during that yes. season too, because yeah. nobody wants to eat a very heavy food when, for example, it's 122 degrees, no. you know, it's not. And when I was in, in the fitness world, you know, for a long time, I mean, at one time I was eating about two pounds of lamb a day. I mean, it was just meat and meat and meat and, and all types of things and whatever, but I, it never felt right. And then when I moved out to Arizona and I started, you know, doing a lot of fasting, eating once a day, you know, just kind of cleansing, I just felt completely different, you know, and, and it just, it resonates on a whole different level. And even with breakfast, you know, when I was a little kid and would eat like cereal and milk. Oh yeah, me too. I was, yeah, everybody, everybody did, you know, when we, when we, you'd have that, you'd fall asleep afterwards, mm -hmm. you know, I would walk into school and I would pretty much fall asleep. And yep. it's like, how am I being productive if I'm always sleeping for the first two classes? And right. then I wake up and be like, okay, now I'm here again, you know? So for a long time now, I mean, I don't even, I don't even have breakfast, you know, I'll just have a coffee with a raw milk and some superfoods or something. But you know, that it's just, I've changed a lot of things because a lot of things don't make any sense. And even right. our, you know, food pyramid, when you get mm -hmm. into that and you look at all of these servings, when do you, how you do you need to eat all, how are you going to get oh, all that in? Yeah, 12 to 14 <laughs> servings of one thing. It just no. I barely fathom just a small amount and then let alone eating that amount all the time. And the other thing too, is we should eat to be, you know, to be healthy and, and sufficient. Mm -hmm. you, know, you eat your meals, they should have a lot of, you know, you do a lot of organic fruits and vegetables and all these things and different colors just like nature. You know, if you're always eating the same color, well, then you're missing out on all the other colors and frequencies that are coming from that. So I think that's another important part when people are kind of selecting their plate to make sure that there's a lot of color involved. Otherwise, you're just eating like the same color every single time. And then the same frequency, which if we think of all these trees and plants like we were talking about, they all have different colors and different frequencies and at different seasons. Hmm. Curious about your thoughts on plants and melatonin, or if you know much about that, because it's something I've kind of started looking into a little bit, because I didn't know that plants actually make melatonin. Have you looked into that topic at all? Or am I catching you off guard a little? <laughs> you, I think you got me. Yeah, because I, I, I haven't read anything about that. I know like valerian root and mm -hmm. things like that can help boost melatonin levels for while you're sleeping. But I did not know that they're uh, creating yeah. Melatonin. Yeah, plants actually make melatonin. So that's oh. why I was, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. I've been looking a lot about into melatonin just because it's this really interesting master antioxidant and can do so many amazing things in the body and then stumbled upon like, yeah, plants make melatonin also. It's it's pretty, huh. pretty interesting, yeah. My buddy in Australia was talking about how they would take like 60 milligrams of melatonin a day and it would Gosh. put him into this super hyper state and he would just repair and he said how like it was all, you know, the opposite, you know, of like what we were told, they were like, Oh, if you take after two, it's, it's, you know, bad. But he was, he was talking all about this, but I know what the plants, I do know they sleep. I, I read yeah. a book one time they talk about where they were sleeping and plants are sleeping as the sun goes down. And then plants can also respond to you or the person mm -hmm. who takes care of them. So for example, if a person ever gets injured from a distance, like let's say a mile away, the person who's taking care of the plants gets injured if they put an EKG up to the plant, the EKG on the plant will actually spike and they'll feel the injury that what? the person is going through. So plants are very connected to us and very aware. And if you go to cut like a basil plant, the other basil plant, the EKG will actually spike and know that you're cutting it. So it's very fascinating when you get into the plant world, how much is interconnected and how much, you know, we're, we're really not taught about. Very interesting. Yeah. I take care of all the plants in the house. I used to always kill plants until the last like couple of years that I've done some kind of work on myself, my nervous system, and I've been able to keep the plants alive. And I talk to my plants. I water them only with structured water. I'm kind of like weird about my plants. Um, but I haven't gotten into the electroculture thing. So I'm interested to, to see if I can start implementing that. Um, how would somebody do that with indoor plants or can you do that with indoor plants? They have to be outdoors. So electroculture will work indoors, outdoors, basements, anywhere. 
So what you can do is you can find a piece of wood that's in your backyard because mm-hmm. the wood resonates at the same frequency as you. And then you can get a piece of copper. You can go to the hardware store, get some copper wire and just wrap some coils around that piece of wood so that the copper is going up into the air and the other piece of copper is going into the ground or the potted plant, whichever mm-hmm. it may be. And you just put that antenna in that plant and you just let it do its thing. Mm-hmm. And so it works indoors. It works outdoors. You know, and it's very easy to start with. You just need a little copper and a piece of wood. And I've seen remarkable things. I had a buddy who was who was growing potatoes in his basement, and the potato plant got taller than the basement. And he goes, I need to get it out of here because it's getting too large. But he's like, it's still winter time. And just all these just crazy stories. I mean, I've had people where they show me like banana leaves, and they're, I mean, like this large, just absolutely enormous. Uh, people with aloe vera plants doubling and tripling in size and then sprouting all little babies because the copper helps amplify the aloe vera plant, which is a very sacred plant because of the rhodium that's inside uh, the rhodium and the iridium that's inside the aloe vera plant. So, you know, it, just remarkable things indoors and out. And if you want to add something to your electroculture antennas, you can take something like a crystal or a quartz. I was going to ask about the crystals, yeah. Place on top, and then as you wrap that with copper, what will happen is it'll create a piezoelectric effect, which mm. amplifies the energy, and then you'll also get the reflection of whichever stone it may be onto your plants. Mm. Because same like us with the colors and the artificial colors, we need natural hues. And that's what those stained glass windows were back in the cathedral. Mm. People would sit in front of those to heal. Now, if you take your plants and put them in front of a crystal that emits like a blue hue, like azurite or malachite or something like that, then or lapis, then what will happen is it'll get the reflection off the stone onto your plants and amplify your plants as well. And there's just so much into this because it's color therapy. That's what they used to do, put it in front of colors and they would Mm -hmm. heal, just like whatever clothes you're wearing depends your mood. You know, so it's just fascinating when you get into all of this of what we can be doing to help our plants and help connect. And as you said about talking to plants, Marcel Vogel, the man who created the LCD, the liquid crystal display, our original screens, he actually used to talk to his plants all the time to a point where his wife was saying, are you just going to sit around and talk to these plants? And he's like, yes, until I get the information I'm trying to get. And he actually created the liquid crystal display, which was the screen using quartz crystals in our screen. So it's fascinating when you get into these topics. Interesting. So do you need the wood and the crystals or can you just do the crystals? You can do the, you you would do the wood and the copper. The copper is essential for the copper yes. and the coils, but you don't have to have the crystals. You know, any, a person can just make simple antennas and start there, or they can just make simple coils, you know, with just copper too. You know, okay. you can have fun with it. And the fun part of this whole thing, and, and as I got into it, is that it starts to open up the creative mind. You can kind of experiment and have fun. And what was funny is I had a little eight-year-old tag me on YouTube where he was going around filming his electroculture gardens and learning all about it because his squash was two times the size. And the funny thing is his his camera is shaking the whole time and he's so excited, you know, to show this. But it's 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 opening up that creative side and the energetic side that we've lost, you know, connecting mm-hmm. to the energy. So you get to have fun and be creative. And I've seen people, my buddy. The other day, his name's Todd. He's about 62. He's just giddy. He's putting antennas all over his, his garden. And it just, it get, and he's like, I'm just excited to do it. And I think that's a part that we're missing because sometimes with too much technology, yeah, the thinking is done for you, mm-hmm. but you're not acting. And the electroculture brings us into the acting. Interesting. Yeah, we've gotten very much away from that connection with the earth, with going outdoors, just period. And so I think that this is a really fun thing people could try um, at home. If you you don't have to be like, have a bunch of land or anything like that, you could just do this. I'm going to try it with my indoor plants and see how it goes. Um, Cause they're already doing really well with what I do, but why not? uh, Why not take it up a notch? Well, and it's something interesting that I noticed with this is I've seen plants go through molting phases, Hmm. like an insect. So I've seen plants where they'll go through a phase where some person will go, well, I started electroculture and my plant's kind of acting a little strange. And then all of a sudden it just sprouts and just starts going crazy. And I've realized that plants or trees and all of these things go through molting processes, just like insects. And it's just wild because everything's interconnected, but it's just very fascinating when you get into this. And like I said, you might notice more bees and pollinators and things like that too, as well, because they pick up on all these 
infrared frequencies. frequencies which are being emitted from the plants. Wow. I didn't know that plants could emit uh, UV and infrared. Like so indoor plants can too, or just, I know outdoor plants can, I know we can get it off of grass and, and leaves and things like that, but I didn't know that indoor plants could. So all plants will emit an infrared and UV frequency from them. Mm. And that mm. infrared or UV frequency sometimes can be to tell insects to come clean them up. So mm. if they're injured or harmed, they might start emitting an infrared or UV frequency so that insects can pick that up and they can come mm. clean them up. And that's why when a person say, I have, I have all these pests, I don't know what to do. Well, your plants are emitting frequencies. And when you start to pour all the chemicals or whatever to try to get rid of them, they're going to emit more frequencies. So you're going to have uh, more insects. So you should be focused on healing the soil, using some basalt and things like that, and really kind of bringing back the soil. Because once you do that, then the plants will stop emitting those frequencies. And it's just, it's fascinating because I had so many people, they're like, I got, you know, I got these insects. I don't know what to do. And it's like nature's trying to clean up what is broken. Mm. And that's what I realized when I got into all the pesticides and these chemicals, a lot of them have a lot of iron. And mm. Victor Schauberger showed if you put a lot of iron in your soil, you have a lot of rust and decay. And that's mm. why slugs come about. Slugs come to clean up all the rust and decay. So if you put mm. copper in the soil, you increase the energy and the conductivity and the flow. And all of the pesticides that are being sold at our hardware store always have a lot of iron. And it was wild because what started me on this whole journey was Victor Schauberger presented all of this in the 1940s. Every single thing that I'm telling on this podcast was presented in the 1940s. And all of this information was lost because a politician was getting a kickback from a fertilizer company and decided not to go with any of these copper tools. And they put out a radio broadcast and newspaper broadcast about how if you use copper tools in your soil, you'll yield too much food and not make enough money. So we have this scarcity mindset, which has been created of we're going to run out of food and not have enough of this and not right. have enough of that. But we've known all this long that we can have the abundance. But because somebody was getting a kickback, this information was lost. So when that part of the book that I read was in there, I actually tried it. And I tried it on my balcony with my uh, third floor balcony on Scottsdale with a Moringa pot. And I had a Moringa plant just growing. And the average Moringa pods are usually about six inches. Mine were 18 to 22 inches. And I was completely blown away. So then I started talking about this. And then I had a buddy reach out. This was just a couple months ago. So this is like a, a, two, a, a year and a half time span. But about two months ago, who's in Florida, who now has 35 inch Moringa pods. So six right. times the size of what we normally know. So the real question is, is how much abundance of food can we actually have Mm -hmm. just by tapping into the beautiful energy of Mother Earth. Wow. And the other question that I have, last one, um, just to wrap it, is the whole issue with minerals and the soil, because that's one I hear quite a bit, especially kind of in the alternative health community is, you know, our food has less minerals in it. We're, that's why we're all mineral deficient. The soil has less minerals. How does this technique play into that issue or does it? So it's interesting. I was looking at a book from 1922 that was in German that talked about they did the mineral analysis of an electroculture plant versus a non-electroculture plant. And what they noticed was the electroculture plant had two times more minerals than the non-electroculture plant. And they basically came to the, the conclusion that the plants were creating their minerals out of the atmosphere from the electroculture antennas that they are using. So when it comes to it, plants can do just about anything. They can make all of the things that they need, but if they don't have the right conductivity and the right flow of energy and everything's kind of being blocked up, then they can't thrive. You know, so you can use electroculture to help increase your yields and also the nutrient profile of your foods. And the other thing people can look into is just using basalt, volcanic paramatic clay. And this is basically the, the ash that comes out of volcanoes all the time. It goes through an alchemy process or a transmutation as it spews up into the air and gets cooked by 5,000 degrees. It lands back down on the ground. It's loaded up with quartz, which is, creates that piezoelectric effect. And it's got all these beautiful minerals. So we can be using things like basalt and electroculture to amplify our foods and the minerals that are in them. Because if the plant can't function, how is it supposed to do anything? If it can't, right. it can't defend itself, it can't produce anything. I mean, simply put, it's just like these flowers. If they're not, if, if it can't 
function and the electrical purpose that it's supposed to happen, then how is it going to produce a flower? And then those those frequencies can't get pulsed out to bring all these beautiful sparrows and everything else. So it's it's fascinating when you get into this, but you can use electroculture, basalt, and you can also look into Steiner prep if you want to get into all those beautiful recipes of what Steiner used to do with the cow horns and quartz and manure. Interesting. Yeah, because we're just kind of being told that our soil is getting worse and worse and we've only got a certain amount of crops left. And I'm just like, would nature really do that? Like, <laughs> you know, there even in the alternative world, like I, I keep saying the alternative health space, to me, it's becoming just as toxic as allopathic medicine with all the fear. Um, so you're saying that this could be a way that we don't have to go down that route, correct? Yes, 100%. And I've realized that because you have to think about back in when they used to do alchemy, they used mm -hmm. to turn lead into gold. Mm -hmm. You don't have any gold, but you turn lead into gold. So if you think about that, even with our soil, if our soil is all messed up from glyphosate and all the other nonsense mm -hmm. that they put in there, we can counter it and restore it. That's how nature works. Like you said, everything works in harmony. There's always something on this side, a positive and a negative. And we just have to learn what the counter is. There was a guy, I believe I watched, who was doing things with biochar. And he like completely reversed his soil just using biochar. Mm -hmm. And everything was completely fixed. And he's like, you're just adding the conductivity back to the soil. And it's just going to work again. And like, if we're, and that's the thing I realized, like everything we're doing is like blocking up the energy. You know, it's kind of like acupuncture. You're, you're popping yeah. back on meridian pathways. Yeah. So same thing with our practices. If we're using all these tools and all these things that are gunking everything up, we can't expect abundance. It doesn't make any sense. So we have to go back to understanding how can we, you know, elevate our terrain and help improve everything as a whole. Because like we said, nature will work naturally that way. It doesn't mm -hmm. work when it's all chemically, you know, sprayed and things like that. And we can't expect anything to be healthy if we just spray chemicals on it. It doesn't, right. it's, it doesn't make any sense. Agree. 100%. Well, this has been super interesting. I'm sure I'm going to have lots of questions uh, from this episode. So where can people find you? Let's talk a little bit about some of your website and some of the other interesting things that you do. So they can find us on cultivateelevate.com. We have a whole list of all different types of superfoods and beautiful things like dragon's blood and pearl, which I'm very big on healing the pathways of the body because mm -hmm. certain things feed certain pathways. So pearl helps to feed the eyes, the hair, the skin, the nails, and the spleen which is that beautiful organ that needs food. Um, and then we have also things like dragon's blood, which we've had great success with. It's an ancient tree sap that uh, has over 3 million antioxidants in it. So it's absolutely remarkable. And it's the highest auric value food on the planet. So I, I basically was trying to learn all these different types of superfoods to help heal our body and also provide us solutions as well. But you can find us on cultivateelevate.com. We have a whole list of information on there. We have an electroculture tab as well. We have a Telegram page, which is now, a hit, I think, 45,000 people wow. of just showing their gardens. And I had a, a lady the other day who showed her 42-pound watermelon, you know, just what? crazy stuff. Yeah, just, wow. just it's, it's fun to watch and to see all of these pictures and videos, sunflowers like 20 feet tall, you know, all these beautiful things. But we have a Telegram channel that I, I try to get, every, you know, we try to share and I... I'm writing a book on electroculture, which I'm going to be showing everybody across the world doing electroculture. And I want to be able to feature all these beautiful things because if we don't see it, sometimes we don't believe it, you know, because right. it's like, it doesn't make any sense. But there are people who've been doing it in the past and there's people who've been doing it today. But we have our Telegram channel with Cultivate Elevate and then we have YouTube and Instagram. And our Instagram, when you do follow us, it will say, you know, the false and misleading information. Right. Right? <laughs> want to follow this. And I post a lot of videos up on there too. So I try to put it everywhere so people can have an option, but you can find us on Cultivate Elevate on all the different platforms. Awesome. And I'll link that in the show notes as well for anybody listening or watching. And uh, thank you again for being here today. Yeah, thank you for having me on. And I, it, was a, it was a great one and I'm happy to share. Thank you for listening to today's podcast episode with Matt from Cultivate Elevate. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to share it out with a friend, family member, or leave us that review over on Apple or Spotify. It would be greatly appreciated. And thank you to my sponsors, Viva Rays. You can use my code Yogi to save on their circadian glasses. 
That link is in the show notes for you. And then Upgraded Formulas, a fantastic source for hair tissue mineral analysis with a consultation for getting to the bottom of your mineral needs. Code Yogi12 or Yogi if you've already used that one before. Again, check that out linked in the show notes. And thank you again for listening to today's episode. If you did enjoy it, head on over to Apple or Spotify to leave us up to that five-star review. I'm always hoping to broaden your mind to bring in new ideas, new information, and continue these conversations. So I appreciate your help. I appreciate your support. And I look forward to talking with you again very soon. 